a ring around the earth? Really? Possibly a ring around the earth at some time in its past? I mean, you know, the other big planets get their rings. Why, why is Earth chipped? Why, why does it make any sense that Earth wouldn't be able to have a ring too? It would have been pretty cool to have a ring. Well, actually, pretty cool. <laughs> it could have cooled the Earth's surface. In fact, this paper suggests that uh, having a ring around the Earth was actually a problem in the past in the order vision. But a friend recently uh, noted this particular paper. It just came out, you know, like a week ago. I, I had missed it. And... Um, I don't know how I missed it. Why didn't this make bigger news? I mean, it's it's kind of a cool story. The idea that the Earth might have had a ring at some point. Well, maybe for a fairly short period of time. But nonetheless, um, had you taken a snapshot from outer space of the Earth, we would have had maybe possibly a little faint ring around it. It's it's This is a really fascinating piece of detective work that's been done here. Uh, by Andrew Tompkins, Aaron Martin, and Peter K. Wood uh, from the School of Earth, Atmosphere, and Environment in Melbourne, Australia. So these Australian scientists uh, have been looking at scars on the Earth, right? They've been looking at uh, craters from asteroid impacts uh, and came across an interesting pattern. And that pattern suggests that there was a ring around the Earth. And what happened to that ring? What happens to most rings about, about other planets is they eventually decay, right? The gravity of the planet itself, eventually they begin to circle in closer and they'll fall in. Uh, and if they don't burn up, strike the surface of the planet. And that's what's suggested here is that there was a ring around the Earth that decayed, leaving a whole bunch of pockmarks on the Earth in the Ordovician. Yeah, where would that, um, where did the planet get its ring? Uh, might have gotten a ring from some sort of wayward um, bolide that came close to the Earth, a near miss encounter, but the gravity of the Earth broke it up into pieces and captured it basically in orbit. And then over time, it would have basically come in to be into an equatorial orbit and kind of spread itself out. So, I mean, that's what you see with the rings and Saturn, right? They're actually very, very thin, right? Uh, shockingly thin, given how wide the rings are. So what I want to do is I just want to take a quick read through the abstract of this article, and then we'll take a look at a couple of the images and talk about the evidence for this particular ring. And then, of course, what I want to do is I want to relate this to the question of young Earth creationism, the age of the Earth, and um, and the challenge that the, this particular evidence, uh, this particular puzzle that's been put together uh would make no sense within this, with respect to uh, flood geology, the idea that all the world geological column comes from a single short one-year period in which all these layers were laid down, including the layer of rock that represents the Ordovician. Um, so this is this really highlights when a, a, a moment when you look at specific things in that geological column, and you're able to from that extract. Um, really interesting past events that have occurred to the Earth. But none of this signal, and we're, that's what we're going to do here. We're going to look at the signal that's in, in the fossil record, actually in the geological record. And we're going to ask ourselves, is, are they reasonably inferring from the geological column that there could have been a ring? Or is it, does that make sense? And if it does, well, flood geology can't make any sense of that particular data. It would, be, it would be absolute nonsense. There's no, there was, there's no way you could come to these conclusions from flood geology. All right, let's, let's explore that very quickly. All large planets in the solar system have rings. It's been suggested that Mars has had a ring in the past. Yeah, I've read that about that before. This raises the question, hey, you know, why not the Earth? You know, why can't the Earth have had a ring uh, in the past? Here we examine the paleo latitudes of 21 asteroid impact craters and an anomalous 40 million year period of enhanced meteorite impact cratering known as the Ordovician impact spike. Now, this is something that was already known before this particular article was published. So this isn't like they discovered all these asteroid impacts. There's been a large number of people, a, large, a bunch of institutions who have studied impact craters on Earth for a variety of reasons. And they've noted that there is an especially high number of impact craters in Ordovician layered rocks, right? Dated to that particular age of the Ordovician some 400 something million years ago. And so it already has a name, the Ordovician impact spike. And it covers a region around 40 million years. So when they date these craters, 
Um, they're not all dated to the same age. There's enough differences between the dates that it doesn't seem like it's all the result of a single impact event. And you're like, well, how could you get multiple craters in a single impact event? Well, if you have a, if you have some kind of asteroid, right, that is broken up in space and it's in little chunks, like the what was it, Shoemaker Levy um, asteroid impact on what was that? Was that Jupiter or Saturn? I can't remember now. Um, yeah, can't remember which of those planets. So we actually we actually got to witness the multiple different pieces impacting that planet over a period of of hours. Um, but if you spread those pieces out farther and they happen to hit the Earth, you could have a series of impacts that occurred over, you know, maybe years or maybe even, you know, hundreds of years or maybe even thousands of years. Um, so that's a possibility in terms of explaining um, these these particular craters. But that doesn't seem to be what's going on here. And that'll become evident as we as we look through this paper a little bit more. Um, point is that this spans a, a long period of time, 40 million years. That'd be hard to explain by a single sort of stream of asteroids that are coming in the same sort of direction at the Earth and then hitting them over a period of 40 million years. Um, now, the other thing is that they looked at paleo latitude of those 21 meteor uh, asteroid impacts. Now, paleo latitude, that is the thing that led them to this particular discovery. Paleo latitude is, well, what is latitude? Latitude is like where you are on the earth, like you're at the equator, all right? And you could be 10 degrees above it or 10 degrees below it, 30 degrees and so forth, all the way up to the North Pole. So that's your, that's your latitude, right? Paleo latitude would be where were you in the ancient, in the past, right? So like I'm in Ohio right now and you could ask like, well, where was Ohio in the Jurassic period? Because remember, the plates are moving around. Remember, all the plates of the Earth are jostling around, right? Some are, are being crammed together and some are sliding past each other and some are pulling apart, all right? So all the plates are moving in some sense, which means the farther back you go in time, the more the, the less likely it is that uh, where you are standing on this Earth right now, wherever you are, is where you would have been if you'd been in that past time, all right? So if you go back just 10 million years, you're not gonna be too far off. But if you go back 100 million years, you could be a thousand miles away, all right, from where you are now. Uh, and so paleo latitude would be like, where were the continents in the Ordovician? Where were the land masses in the Ordovician relative to today? And so there's a whole there's a whole bunch of different ways in which paleo latitude is is investigated and studied, and we can figure out. And that's where you get those maps that show like this continent was here, and then it slid over here, and then it went up here over over time, right? Uh, the whole continental drift plate tectonics thing. Um, okay, well, okay, so let's find out what happened here. The meteor spike. We find that all craters fall in an equatorial band, less than thirty degrees. All right, so you have the equator and you have 30 degrees above it, 30 degrees below it. All of these impact craters from this 40 million year period lie in that 30 to 30 region, all right, around the equator. So that's an interesting distribution. Interesting distribution given these are 21 separate impact craters, right? And then they note that despite 70% of the exposed potential crater preserving crust, Remember, we only have so much of the actual rock from the Ordovician left. Uh, some of it's been eroded because this is really old stuff. But not only that, um, it's only exposed in certain places in the world because, I mean, in a lot of places, the Ordovician isn't at the surface. Um, and, it, and it's in a place where we can't investigate it with respect to, like, craters. Um, and so it might be buried under 5,000, 10,000 feet of other rock above it from all those other, you know, eras of rock. And so there's only a few places on earth we can go and actually like, hey, here's Ordovician rock, Ordovician aged rock at the surface. And we can actually look at the exposed rocks. And then if we think something has a crater like appearance, we can study that rock and see uh, the, the characteristics of, you know, the the impact of that causes metamorphic changes to those rocks and leaves residue right in the rocks of the crater of the or the asteroid itself right so rare earth elements and so forth can be found in those so there's a whole, a whole bunch of indicators of the 
indicators that there was a there was an impact at that particular site. So these 21 impact craters, once they figured out the paleo latitude of them, it suddenly became like, well, wait a second, they're all just in a belt around the equator. Whereas 70% of all the ore division land that we can even investigate is not in that region around the equator. It's other places on Earth. And yet those other places don't have any craters. And so that's an interesting distribution, right? So these are the kind of like pieces of, these are the facts. These are the observations that we make. They kind of make you go, hmm, why is that? Like it makes you ask questions. Shouldn't you expect it to be kind of like roughly evenly distributed across the different exposures? You might not expect there to be as many asteroid impacts at the um, the North Pole and the South Pole, just because the orientation of the Earth along the plane of the rest of the solar system. And if there are comets and other things that are dislodged from other places uh, and then coming circling around the sun, they're most likely to hit us somewhere sort of between the North Pole and the South Pole and not sort of straight down in into the North Pole and South Pole. But really, statistically, it's not like you would expect them all to be along the equator. For one thing, we're not exactly angled exactly along the equatorial plane of the solar system. Uh, and asteroids are coming from all kinds of different directions. And basically, you have this round blob, right? And you can hit it in any one of those places. Uh, it's going to be at more of an angle if it comes in down here, which is going to create a different kind of crater, but it's going to create a crater nonetheless. And so this distribution of having all 21 craters from this 40, mo 40 million year period of rock that's been dated from multiple different all kinds of places on Earth, and it only shows up in equatorial band, very interesting pattern that kind of begs for an explanation. The beginning of this period is marked by a large increase in L chondrite material accumulated in the sedimentary rocks that are 465.76 plus or minus 0 0.3 or 300,000 years. Um, so within a very tight band in terms of our radiometric dating. So there's a bunch of chondrite material. So that just means that there's a unusual distribution of certain elements, right, that are not as commonly found on Earth in that distribution, found in this layer of rock. And that can be found like in all in, in rock this age, which is all Ordovician, across many different places where it's exposed on Earth, right? Not just along the equatorial band. So there is this chondrite material, right? That would come from asteroids, which together with the impact spike has long suggested to result from the breakup of an L chondrite parent body in the asteroid belt. Our binomial probability calculation indicates that it is highly unlikely that the observed crater distribution is produced by bolides on orbits directly from the asteroid belt. In other words, all 21 of these things aren't 21 separate asteroids that all came from the asteroid belt, all happened to hit the Earth right in the same sort of zone, right? Spread out over 40 million years, right? That 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 is statistically highly unlikely, right? The pattern we see seems like it ha must have another explanation. We therefore propose instead a large fragment of an L chondrite pattern broke up due to tidal forces during a near miss encounter with the earth about 466 million years ago given the longevity of the impact spike the sediment hosted l chondrite debris accumulation we suggest that the debris ring formed after this breakup event from which the material deorbited to produce the observed crater distribution okay what are they talking about there they're saying like okay you had this huge chunk of rock comes in very close, basically gives it, comes so close to the Earth that the Earth basically rips it apart, right? Some of it probably does follow the Earth, and there's lots of small debris that gets burned up, and so you end up with basically a dust, and you have stuff that falls to the Earth, and that, that ends up getting this, like, initial, like, layer of chondrite material, right, that's just found mixed in with rocks that age at 467 million years ago or 66 million years ago. And then they're suggesting that, well, what explains the large impact craters we see? 
because there, there isn't like large impact craters right at 466. It's like they start occurring a little bit later. Um, what they suggest is these large pieces, right, didn't actually follow the Earth, but they got trapped in the Earth's uh, gravity field, right? And so they start to circle the Earth. And as they circle the Earth, eventually they're going to spread out, they're going to spread out along a, a an orbit that's going to be around the equator, right? So, I mean, look at all the other planets that have rings. I mean, almost all of them are like directly associated with the equatorial, um, you know, the spin of the of the planet. Right, so you then have these large chunks of rock out there, right, floating around the Earth, and but over time, large pieces fall to the Earth as they get pulled closer and closer and closer to the Earth, and they're probably having a little bit of resistance from the upper atmosphere at some point, right, which creates drag and you know all that stuff. So you end up with, I mean, the physics of this is not not that complex in terms of predicting how large of a rock and the speed of the rocks they're going and how long it would take for them to fall out and deorbit okay and so they're falling back to earth and then of course they're creating large impact craters now where are they going to fall if they're in a ring they're going to fall near the equator right this is this messy ring out there and they're falling at slightly different angles they're going to kind of spread out over this range of 30 degrees to 30 degrees on either side of the equator and that would explain the interesting distribution of these things Ah, then they go on They say, well, now that we've happened to notice uh, this pattern of where these craters are and have a possible explanation for why, how, what could create this pattern of craters spread out over 40 million years. So the idea is that it took 40 million years for all of the different objects that are in this ring to fall out, to deorbit which is why we don't have a ring anymore, right? I mean, the, the ring decayed, it disappeared. And we know that rings on other planets are not super old, right? The planet might be 4 billion years old, but the, the rings around Saturn uh, are on the order of just maybe millions of years old, right? Maybe even less than that. So they're, they're collecting other pieces of broken up uh, asteroids. They've had impacts near them and they've created rings from them, but the rings aren't going to last forever. Um, so Earth might have had a small ring at some point in the Ordovician. All right, so then, then they say like, okay, well, that's since we noticed this, we also noticed something else that has really not been explained before about the Ordovician. And that is we further speculate that the shading of the Earth by this ring, there might have been enough debris, not just the large chunks themselves, but um, all the dust, all right, from that breakup would have created this plane that is potentially blocking a couple percent of the sun. And it only takes blocking a couple percentages, you know, of the total amount of energy from the sun to create massive cooling on the earth. And that triggered cooling in the uh, Hernantian global ice house period. All right, so that's another thing that's been identified in the geological column is a noticeable dip in the global temperature that's very abrupt uh, in this at this very time in the Ordovician, and then it slowly recovers over time. All right, so at what 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 do you? Oh, let's just go down to the figure here. It's got a great figure in here. Um, all right, so here are all these gray bars represents the possible range of age of different asteroid impacts. And these are all impacts that are all found in a 40 million year, art, year old range. That's this, this uh, range in here. Uh, and some of the impacts are poorly dated. In other words, they're plus or minus, you know, 10 or 15 million years. Um, that's, you can think of that as sort of the error bar there. And some are more precisely uh, dated uh, for a variety of reasons. But here's, a, here's a, a number of these asteroid impacts. And so you have this uh, this Breca deposits, all right, you had this stuff that had fallen, you know, initially uh, out of the atmosphere and so accumulated in the rocks. And, and so there's this common, you know, common um, um, rare earth elements that are found in this one particular zone of the geological column. And then you have asteroid impacts. So you had some that occurred right away on the earth. And then over time, various ones fell to earth and then here's the temperature profile of the earth right it was already kind of falling before this particular point but then you have as you know over a period of several million years you have the the whole earth's climate basically declining 
all right well at least the global temperature uh, and this is pretty extreme if you know your climate changes uh, proposed climate changes over earth's history this is a pretty extreme change um, for that for that amount of time and for the rebound all right so then as the asteroids fall to the earth and they're going to create their own debris clouds and all that stuff right there each one of these asteroid impacts some of them are quite large uh, nothing like the asteroid that uh, struck the Yucatan Peninsula, but nonetheless, large enough to create enough of a plume that it's probably also affecting the atmosphere. So that's also created, making it get colder, right? Having too many particulates in the atmosphere. And so as that begins to clear and there are fewer asteroid impacts, because even by this time here, uh, because we don't know exactly what the date is here, I mean, it could have been as early as here. So potentially there's, you know, all the large stuff has fallen out, deorbited, all right? And now you're just left with, um, now the air is clearing, you're getting more sunlight, and then you have a rebound. Uh, and so this causes a, a certain amount of extinctions and problems with the, the ecosystem uh, at this particular time. And that's, that's the other thing that's identified uh, with the rocks at this time. Um, so th these are just some figures showing uh, a number of different asteroid impacts, their estimated um, ages, uh, well, actually paleo latitudes, um, showing that they're falling within this 30 to 30 range, right? And so there's, you know, some 70% of the rest of the Earth left for which we don't see these impacts in. So really interesting pattern. This is the same thing, kind of summed up the statistics of that. Yeah, they're all within this narrow band in terms of location and then they go through and they're talking and, and this is kind of instructive here right these are all the the continents today um but showing you of the continents what is ordovician rock and so these light and darker bronze colors that's where you'll find ordovician rock that's either very close to the surface or at the surface all right it's exposed in various areas so these are the only places on Earth where that, that stuff is exposed. Um, North America, you see, I'm right in here. Um, we have some Ordovician rock down in uh, down in uh, Cincinnati area, right? Very famous for, that's what the Ark Encounter sits on, is Ordovician rock, uh, which was all a shallow ocean at the time. So now, here, here we go. So here's the Paleo map. Here is the paleo latitudes for all the different, um, we we'll call them continental regions in the Ordovician. So this map looks, you know, it's like, well, I don't know what that is, right? You know, there is where it's proposed the Earth's surface was, right? Everything else is covered with water. Uh, so this is Laurentia. And here we have what will become Australia. Uh, the basal port of Australia is super old. The center of Australia is extremely old. And this is Antarctica next to it. And then we have India over here because India eventually splits off from Antarctica and Africa. Uh, this is South Africa over here. So this, this is an African region. Uh, and this is this would be North America, right? And Ohio is uh, basically right here. All right, it's in the water at the time. Uh, but it's a very shallow water. Actually, all this is like a continental shelf. And so this is all very shallow water, and that's why we have the, the types of fossils we have um, here because of that. All right, so then where are the, um, the asteroid impacts? There's one over here in Australia. We don't really have, we can't see them in Antarctica. So Antarctica is right here on the equator at the time. And so it, unfortunately, this area where there's not a lot of Ordovician rock like exposed at the surface, and so therefore it's not surprising we haven't found craters there. But you might predict that the Ordovician rock that's there, underneath there, might contain craters because there's a crater here. And then across North America, where we have another places, a, a number of places where we have Ordovician rock, we see a number of craters there, and we also have craters over here as well. Um, so that's this, this band across here. There is Ordovician rock all over the place exposed down here and even up here, but we don't see any craters there. You might be wondering yourself, like, how in the world, how in the world do they know that Ohio was right here, right? Because Ohio is up here now. 
<laughs> okay. You know, it's like, um, how did he go from here up to here? Well, I mean, that's plate tectonics. But how do we know which directions it went for and so forth? Well, at any time when you have new, well, I'll try to, how can I do this simply? Anytime you have new magma formed, right? You have volcanic material and uh, volcanoes oozing lava out on the surface. And when it solidifies, there's going to be magnetic particles, right? Little, little shards of things that are going to be magnetic inside of that, you know, liquid rock. And then when it eventually solidifies, well, because it was in liquid, all those magnetic particles, as it sits there and it becomes, and the rock's kind of like really still at a pool, eventually all the magnetic particles are going to do what? They're going to line up toward, you know, the North and South Pole, right? So they're going to, they're going to point to where the magnetic North Pole is. Not exactly where the North Pole is in terms of where we spin on the axis, but where the magnetic North Pole is, which does move around, which is what makes this really tricky. Right? <laughs> That's why there's a, a lot of work done on this, a lot of calculations. Nonetheless, you can think of it as like, hey, it's up north. And so if you have, um, if you look at rocks from down here, right? If you look at rocks that are in North America today, and you go through the different layers, what you'll find is some layers have it, you know, the, the magnetic particles are pointed one way, and then sometimes they're pointed this way, and sometimes they're pointed a little bit different direction, sometimes they're pointed like a different direction, right? They seem to be rotating. Well, what would make them rotate? Well, if your continent were moving and rotating, all right, as the continent rotates, Wherever it is when that magma was laid down, it's going to point to the north. But then as the continent moves, well, that rock is now solid. And so when it moves, the magnetic particles can't move to readjust to point north, right? They're just going to point to wherever they were when it solidified. So you can take thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of measurements of rocks from all the different continents and all the different layers. And you can figure out the directions that all these little magnetic needles are pointing, right? And you can reconstruct the paleo latitude. You can reconstruct where it was, where it was, because of the direction it's pointing. Wow. Now there's there's another part of this too, which is harder to describe. I'll do my I'll do a really quick version. And that well, I can't remember the technical term now. Look up paleo dipping, I guess. Um, it's not just that they're pointing north, but that if you if you're down here on the equator and you're pointing north, you wouldn't be pointing like straight this way because the north how can i do that? i need my arms i need my hands over here you got the north pole here and you're on the equator over here right if you're pointing north you'd be pointing like not at the north pole or the magnetic north pole so what you do is you're going to have to be pointing this direction right even though you're on the equator you're laying flat in the rock but you the the needles are actually pointed they're dipped down and then if you're a rock that's somewhere farther north, you don't have to dip down as much. You can you can be you can be like flat on the surface and actually pointing more toward the magnetic north. Uh, so you so you see it's not just the direction it's pointing, it's the dip, right? Whether it's angled up or down. So you have to find rocks that are like pretty much horizontal, or at least you could you can know like okay, it's not horizontal, but it, but it, when it was laid down as magma, it was horizontal. You, know, you have to figure out the horizontal state. And then you can figure out the dip. And depending on the, the amount of dip, you can tell like, oh, this rock was on the equator. This rock was 10 degrees north. This rock was 20 degrees north. And not only was it 20 degrees north, but it was also pointed in this particular direction. So I know that this piece of rock, this whole continent was like shifted over this direction, pointing that direction. All right. All that's to say is you can take these thousands of measurements from all the different exposed rocks on Earth that have these magnetic particles that are laid down via having been liquid before. So you know that the state was chaotic. The needles are pointing all different directions as the magma was moving around and was in solution. And then they get fixed in one place. And now you can use them to say, like, I can figure out exactly where that thing was on the face of the Earth when it solidified. And so if it's solidified in the Ordovician, I can figure out where that rock was in the Ordovician, and that's how you can draw this map. That's how we know. And then you can draw the maps for each successive stage of Earth's history, 
And from there, it was like, well, you connect the dots, right? You know, it's like it was here, and it was here, and then it was here, and then it moved up here, and it moved up here. Ohio was down here. And then over time, it slid all the way up to where it is now. And Antarctica sliding down here and actually twisted and turned because India eventually is on the top of Antarctica. And then it splits off and moves north, right? So back in the order of this is a long time ago, and these planet, these continental pieces are in radically different places than they are today. So here's where here's here to me is the magic of all this. Not magic. Magic's an inappropriate word. This isn't magic. This is following the evidence and coming up with the best explanations for the patterns that we're seeing. This just finding the craters, right? If you found the craters, where are you finding them at? You're finding it in Australia and like North America? And a little bit in in Europe. Uh, well, I'm sorry. Australia is like way far south, and the parts of North America are much farther north than 30 latitude. So, if you just had the craters, and then there's a couple others too, um, and you were to map them on today's continents, they'd be like eh, kind of a random pattern, right? Why are they random? Because they've been moved. The continents have moved all over and moved the craters around relative to where they were originally. So. If you just looked at today's continents and you're like, oh, I'm studying craters. Oh, there's some craters. There's all the craters from the Ordovician rocks. It's like, eh, okay, it's a, it's a random pattern. And they're like, no, wait a second. But that's not where the craters were. Let's find out where they were. And when they found out where they were and they mapped them on the map from the Ordovician, it's like, that's not a random pattern. And since it's not a random pattern, we need an explanation for why the Earth was hit along a belt over a 40 million year span. And the simplest solution to that is that there was a ring around the Earth that then contributed to a rain of asteroid impact, a, a rain of large impacts spread out over a 40 million period while this ring was deorbited. And then there's like a bonus to it. It's like we didn't really have an explanation for why the earth suddenly got colder during this period right after this sort of signature of like like that there was a hype i'm sure there's somebody hypothesized that the reason why we have this signature of rare earth elements in in this one period right there at the beginning is because of some kind of impact but we didn't really have like a giant impact we could like point to kind of like the yucatan peninsula impact which has like you know the layer of iridium layer which is everywhere around the earth um, we didn't have the two things together. We had like this smattering of asteroid impacts that are spread out over time. And that really, you know, the, the most simple hypothesis is this hypothesis. I can't think of a simpler way to explain the origin of this particular pattern of asteroid impacts. Um, all right. So, and then you had, like I said, you have, you had that bonus of the temperature dropping, which before was like, Maybe there was a big asteroid impact, but we don't have the impact, the specific impact. Oh, maybe the series of impacts over a period of a couple million years led to that um, serious uh, change in the climate. All right, so now that brings me to, um, you know, let's just tie this into um, young Earth creationism. You know, what 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 does a young Earth creationist make of this kind of data what do they do with it i mean you pretty much just have to say uh, okay you're just you're seeing patterns but those patterns don't actually exist they, they don't really mean anything there can't really be a pattern there um because all of this rock remember ordovician silurian devonian cambrian jurassic which comes after all this jurassic you know, all these all that all that rock is deposited a giant worldwide flood. And this particular pattern of the Earth's place and time makes no sense in young Earth creationism. Yes, they believe that some of the continents were together at one time. See, they believe there was like a single continent, Pangaea. But uh, in case you don't know it, Pangaea comes long after this. This is before Pangaea, right? You have Gondwandan land and you have Laurentia. You have... Uh, and all these crazy other little pieces of continents floating around, 
right? They eventually kind of come together, <laughs> right? Later on, they're, they're all right, I got it. I got to get it right. They kind of go from the southern hemisphere and then kind of like come up here in the middle of the middle of the equator, northern hemisphere, and then eventually they're going to split apart into North America or the Western world and the Eastern world, right? And that's what young Earth creationists will accept. They accept like there was one big continent that existed, you know, before the flood. It was all one land mass, potentially. And then there was rapid plate tectonics right at the end of the flood that separated all the continents into what we see today. This would be nonsense in a young Earth creationist uh, view. I mean, this particular configuration could have never existed. The thing is, the paleo latitude data suggests exist, right? You look at these little, just these little tiny magnets, all right, inside these rocks. It suggests this particular orientation of this particular, these particular positions for those rocks at the time that they were formed. So if you, if you're curious to say they want to, the world's only, that they were formed during the flood, it still looks like they were formed in these particular locations. Because there is mag magma, all right? There is there is um, basalts in the flood record. And those basalts carry in them this signal of where they were, right? In with respect to the surface of the earth or the magnetic poles of the earth at that particular time. So all of this is like pretty much make-believe data for young earth creationists because it, it can't really have any meaning because all this was just created very, very quickly over a very short period of time. And then what about the asteroid impacts? What about all those impact craters that are in the Ordovician rock, which is in the, in the middle of right the flood year, actually more toward the beginning of the flood year? I mean, they'd have to propose there was all kinds of things hitting the earth all the time because this is just, this is 21 large impacts just from the Ordovician right it is a, it is a like a, a large number for that time frame like only over 40 million years that's a lot of big impacts but that's a fraction of the total impacts that have hit the earth over the, its entire history so for young earth creationists they have to imagine there's tons of impacts going on but again why this particular pattern why why would you get a pattern like this if these continents weren't even where they are now and how would you have a bunch of impacts like just in Ordovician rock across multiple different continents. That would only represent like a week, right? During the during the 52 weeks of the overall flood year. So it's really, it's these kind of studies that just are really nonsensical to the young earth creationists. I, don't, I just don't know, really know what they do with them. I think they, 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 they'll end up just criticizing the methods and saying, well, they don't really work. They're not really that precise. Yeah, there's some lack of precision in some areas, still collecting data. But if anyone who's watched this kind of stuff over the last 20 years, like I have, you can see that we're getting better and better and better as we collect more and more data and we have more precise tools for doing these measurements. And we have a better idea of like where the magnetic pole was at different times because that's also important you know the magnetic pole moves somewhat so where it's pointing to is going to be pointing to where the magnetic pole was at that time so you have the actually there's other studies to figure out where the magnetic pole was <laughs> and you have to correlate all these things together it's sophisticated analysis no doubt about it but the fact that it generates patterns like this that then, you know, see, you have the you have the comic dust. You've got the impacts spread over time and the climate change, right? And the fact that they're all within a particular zone. Those are all coincidences, right? In the young Earth creationist mind, and rather than being coincidences, if you believe in a young in an old Earth, they are an opportunity to discover a really interesting point in history. A point in history when potentially the earth had a ring right the earth had a ring you would have looked up and and seen some kind of probably fuzzy ring out there yeah who knows maybe it, you know at it, it sunset you know it had a, you know had different kinds of uh color light or something like that as it shined off the things you know it, who knows what it was like that would that that seems like that'd be pretty cool <laughs> pretty cool except that uh it made the atmosphere maybe a little bit too cool uh cooler than you'd want to uh, have it be. 
All right. I, I just uh, thought this was a really interesting paper and was kind of excited about it and thought it would be an opportunity to talk about uh, paleomagnetism and uh, asteroid impacts and all that stuff, which I, I really love. I'm not a, you know, I obviously the language I'm using tells you that I'm no like expert on this stuff in terms of like using the language for uh, probably said asteroid wrong and uh, boloid and uh, maybe used them in appropriate situations. But I think I've got the general gist and the general idea, having read a lot of this literature uh, over the years and just always been fascinated uh, by this particular topic. So we'll see. We'll see if other people can come along and find additional evidence that supports this idea that there might have been that Earth might have had a ring in the Ordovician. Uh, but for now, you know, thanks for hanging out with me. Uh, like, subscribe. Uh, I'm working on a. I am. I've well got all my uh, my writing here in front of me. I'm working on a ten part series. Uh, well, it's ten right now. I don't know. Maybe it'll end up being even more. I got a ten part blog series that I'm writing uh, about the Dead Sea. All right, the origins of the Dead Sea, the history of the Dead Sea Basin. Uh, really interesting geology, but also how that in how the origins of the Dead Sea can inform us about uh, how to understand the age of the Earth as well. Uh, and it really has an interesting relationship to the scriptures, since the scriptures talk about the Dead Sea, and that's what's really neat about it, because that kind of puts us that puts some really strict limits on when the Dead Sea could have formed and how it how much it could have changed over time. Uh, and so I've been working a lot on that. I'm going to have a 10, like I said, a 10 part blog series, and I'm probably going to make at least five videos about that. Um, and so I'll have a whole series of videos uh, that come from that, uh, that exploration I'm doing. All right, till then, I will, uh, I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.